Well, good morning and welcome to church. Such a great morning, right? We can come into this house and we can raise up the name of Jesus. If you are here for the first time, we want to say welcome home. Youth, if you are here at the prom, come down to the front. Just feel free to worship however you were created to worship, and we're going to praise our King. Here we go. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down, eating your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you whiter than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive. Living water that brings it dead to life. Oh, oh, oh. We're going down to the river, down to the river, down. Took me from dusty roads into paradise. paradise. All of my dirt, all of my shame, drowned in the streams that made me born again. Like, like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive. Living water that brings it to, to life. Oh, oh, oh. We're going down.
and shadows You gave the world a light to follow A hope that shines beyond tomorrow Your love Your love goes on
you're here this morning, if you're here, God, would you have your way in this house? Would you remind someone that it doesn't feel like they're your child anymore, that they've run too far from home, that they are home right now with you residing in them? Father God, have your way.
Heavenly Father, it's so powerful to worship you. You live within the praises of your people. And as we stand here and lift up our voices, lift up our hearts, lift up our hands, the promises that you come rushing down to fill us. And when you... When your love hits each one of us, you just wash away everything that is painful, everything that is wrong, every selfish thought, word, or deed, whatever it might be, it's gone so that we could be filled with the presence of the living God. And as you come in, suddenly everything gets sorted out and reprioritized suddenly we aren't worried about me myself and I I, I'm concerned about the people at work the the person that irritates me Lord that they become an object of prayer that I lift up and ask that you could bless them and care for them and introduce your grace to them that ongoing battle with the spouse suddenly uh, the spouse becomes somebody that we decide to care for as you see them. And, and, and we know them best, so we know best how to apply Christianity to them. The little ones under our care, whether they're 3 years old, 13 years old, or 33 years old, again, we know them well. We know how to release your grace your encouragement because they're your words your spirits guiding us give us the wisdom not to say what we want to say but to say what you'd like said give us that ability to show love even though we'd rather let them have a piece of our mind kind of like the way you treat us it's what you've said about us that matters that we're your valuable children, that we're your disciples that partner with you as you move to and fro upon this earth, that you've invited us into a friendship where you share your personal thoughts and desires. So we go through every day, there you are to say, that person matters to me, they're hurting. I wish you would go on my behalf to them. And, Wow, we get to be an extension of your hand, your love, your grace. Just as somebody extended that hand, love, and grace to each one of us. Lord, there's so many voices that come at us from outside, even inside of us, that discredit us, that attack us, that criticize us. And we want to put a stop to all voices except yours. We want to hear what you have to say about us. When we read the Bible, it becomes pretty clear. You went to the cross to save us. We're that valuable to you. You put your Holy Spirit inside of us so that we're never apart from you. We're that valuable to you. You've given us your own personal agenda. And didn't, you didn't say, go do it for me. You said, let's go do it together. Follow my lead. That's how valuable we are as your partners. And so when anybody, including your own inner voice, says anything different, today, Lord, we only hear from you. Our eyes are on you. When the storm around us starts to roar, we keep our eyes on you, not on the storm. Peter looked at the waves, and he sunk. Eyes on you, he stood firm. And that's where we're at today. I don't know what storm we've got going on. I don't know what inner chaos would career issue, financial problem, health scare, relational rift, inner brokenness, something we're carrying from the past, a fear we're worried about in the future. All of that we push to the front of the cross of Jesus Christ. And you say, let me have it so that I can give you rest, so that you can be under my care. Wow, God, that's why we come to praise you. And as we praise, we look and see who you are, and we're amazed, we're awed at just how vast your love is, 
how extensive your grace is, how personal your interest in each one of us is, how pervasive your power is. Let us take that power and turn it into prayer authority as we go forth into our everyday praying for people, knowing that the Holy Spirit's activated and something's going to happen because we prayed in the name of Jesus, the source of life, eternal life, redeemed life. Lord, we lift up the name of Jesus right now into this sanctuary and I, I invite you to go to work into each one of our hearts. May we be about the Father's business right now. We're trying to expand your kingdom, Lord. The construction is behind schedule. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would continue to work with the construction team and make the perfect place for you to do your ministry through us. Lord, we need help financially. Would you cause ministries, resources to come our way so that we don't have to struggle with debt? Lord, would you make sure that all the teaching and all the care, the ministry, everything that happens in the new building, like this building, has you, Jesus, at the center of everything about us. And Lord, whether it's that building or this building or every building represented by the homes here today, thy will be done. Come, Lord. We take a quiet, personal moment now to speak to you from the heart. Father, how refreshing to be able to talk to you, lay before you what's on our hearts and minds, the people that we're worried about, the issues we're concerned over, not to mention the praises and thank yous for your incredible faithfulness to us. Even when we're faithless, you remain faithful because that's who you are. That's why we're here to bow the knee that's why we're here to, to open our hearts, to love you back. Pray all of this in the name above all names, the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another.
Welcome to church. So glad that you're here. If you happen to be a guest with us, we're especially glad you're here. In fact, on the seat back in front of you, you should find a green and white card. We'd love to have you pull it out and fill it out and place it in the offering plates as they circulate so we can send you an official greeting from the church. And by the way, on these cards is a prayer request line. If you have something going on in your life, these cards come directly to me and I pray for you. So take advantage of the extra prayer support. And also, for those sitting in the center aisles, you should find a green and white friendship pad. We'd love to have you pull it out and pass it down the aisles so that we uh, know who came to church and you can find out who you're worshiping alongside of. It's a chance for you to make a friend here in church. Just a couple of quick announcements. As you know, we're celebrating our halfway point through the building campaign. And tonight at 5.30, we're going to have a cookout. Now, last week I told you we were going to have hot dogs and hamburgers, and they decided to upgrade it to pulled pork. So, uh, okay. If you were looking forward to hot dogs and hamburgers, I don't know if we're still going to have those, but you are going to have pulled pork. Hey, it's a great time to come and have a party together and celebrate together, take some hard hat tours. By the way, you can take a hard hat tour right after this service. Our team will walk you through the, the new building. You can see what's going on. You can see the prayers on the wall. You can write your prayers on the wall. Lift up the presence of Jesus because this is exciting stuff for all of us, and we want you to be part of it. By the way, if you want to be part of the hospitality team, we need you. Okay? There's going to be a training event today. It's in the afternoon. If you can't make it in the afternoon, just call the office and say, I'd like to be part of the hospitality team. And, and uh, <clears throat> there was enough outrage over the lack of cookies and coffee the last two weeks that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're back. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Uh, we've got staffing needs. Right now, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn Garcia is the most amazing office administrator, but she needs a little bit of help. So we're looking for somebody who's energetic. Yep, yep. Is that her husband who started the clapping? <laughs> We're looking for somebody who's, who's able to multitask and do all the stuff that I don't have to do. She'll tell you what you have to do. So if you are somebody interested in this kind of a position, uh, call the office and, and we'll, uh, we'll see what it's about. If you live in Point Siena or out in Sola Vida, we're starting a life group for you. We've got opportunities for you to, to take care of the, the, those who are hurting in life by the iDignity program at the end of the month. And our kids are going to have a musical at the end of the month next, next, next Sunday night as well. Friends, it's an exciting place to be, this church, because it doesn't matter where you look or what you delve into, you're going to see God's on the move. And so my prayer is that God is moving on you. Amen? Amen. They came to us and said, uh, testing. And they came to us and said, uh, we're going to do a barbecue. And I said, uh, great, what are we going to have? And they said, hot dogs and hamburgers. And I stopped and thought, I don't know where anybody else comes from, but in Texas, that's not a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's got to be like ribs or brisket or pork. And that pork's got to be pulled. And I don't know what that means, but it's, it's a good thing. I love the song that we sang this morning about the faithfulness of God. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. So we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this week. I want to draw your attention to just the simple fact, and that is, I think all of us have the experience with this, that the devil attacks us on three different fronts throughout all of our lives, and that is in our, in our faith, in our family, and in our finances. And uh, probably the best illustration on the faithfulness of God in these areas that I've found in the scriptures is in the Old Testament, it's the children of Israel in Egypt. They spent 430 years in slavery, even though they were supposed to be the people of God, and God was the only God. And here, the Egyptians worshiping all these false idols are, are oppressing God's people. And that doesn't make any sense. That shouldn't have any power at all. Yet, for 430 years, this entire nation of people is oppressed under slavery. Talking, talk about having your faith attacked for generations being oppressed. What about family? Well, when it came time to release the children of Israel and they wanted to leave, Pharaoh says to him, fine, you can go, but you can't take your wives or your kids. Only the men can leave. 
In other words, we got to split the family up. And, and they said, no, that's not going to happen. Pharaoh comes back, what about finances? He comes back and says, fine, you can take your families, but you don't get to take anything with you. You don't get to take any wealth at all. You've got to leave all of that here. Yet they stayed faithful to the faithfulness of God in their lives, saying, okay, our faith is intact, our families are going to be intact, and our finances are going to be intact as well. If you read to the end of the story in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 36, it's a kind of a funny verse because it says, when Pharaoh finally relinquished and let them go, not only did he let them take and worship their God freely and, and, and go to, to worship, not only did he let them keep their families intact, but he also let them take all of their wealth. And it gets even crazier than that. The Egyptians couldn't wait to have these people gone, and so they loaded them down with tons of gold and silver. And so the Bible says that Israel actually took with them the wealth of Egypt. How many of you would say that you, you could use like a financial miracle in your life on some level? How many of you would say that you could use a miracle in your family? And I'm not going to ask you how many of you have been challenged in your faith. Might I just suggest to you and encourage you with this, never give up on the faithfulness of God. I promise you, if you never give up on the faithfulness of God, He won't let you down. So I'm going to pray today, and we're going to believe that in this time of giving, that you experience such an overwhelming blessing from God, that, that in your heart, you're positioned to receive, and that this weekend, this week may be a week of miracles and breakthrough for you in your faith in your family, and in your finances. Pray with me this morning. Father, I just proclaim, release, and declare over this congregation a season of outpouring and blessing in our faith, God. May we be strengthened and established in our families, God. May not one, may not one go astray. Father, I pray that they would constantly hear your voice, that they would know your presence, that they would sense your power in their lives. And Father, in our finances, I know that you are, you are the source of all of our provision. You are our provider. And so, God, we look to you and to you alone. We don't look to the system of this world, but God, we know that you have the answers to every question that's being asked. So, Lord, I pray for those who need a, a miracle in their finances, that this week would be a week of opportunity and provision and supernatural intervention. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you as you give today.
Our vision is to bring the love of Jesus Christ to as many people as we can. Uh, I hope that the new building is a success and it finishes on time. We have a program to expand in three phases, really. The first phase is what you see here now. It's a three-story Christian education building with five classrooms on the first floor for kindergarten and preschool. On the second floor, we have a huge youth gathering space. We will have then the ability to move those classrooms and other activities out of the existing building over here and free up areas in the main church in the sanctuary to expand by 150 seats and also to return things like the chapel to their original intended use. When we get that finished, we will be able to build the next phase, which is the Christian Life and Community Center. We all know the church isn't a building, it's the people of God. We're gonna leave a legacy so we can experience and share the love of Jesus Christ for generations to come. To think about having the new building where we can have more kids, um, and reach more little minds and shape them into successful humans um, and to know Jesus um, is exciting. We invite you to live a legacy with us. Will you join us? Because a legacy isn't something you just leave, it's something you live. Amen. Well, we're at our One Another series, <clears throat> and I found another One Another. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. This is the word of the Lord. I want to talk about your legacy today. I saw this article about J. Paul Getty on the Facebook, and it was amazing. This guy was the wealthiest, most powerful man at the turn of the 19th century. Truly an inspiring, impressive individual. So I got all excited, and I came down to a meeting and said, hey, I just read about J. Paul Getty. Does anybody know who he is? Nobody remembered who he was. The most powerful man a hundred years ago, already forgotten. And I, I bring this up because if you ever thought about your legacy, what you're going to leave for the people behind you, what you're going to pass on to this world. You see, it's important because I'm the guy that does your funerals, okay? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of interesting when you non-churchgoers will, will gather for the, the funeral sermon and and, and they'll say, you know, he always took care of his own. And, and I never say it, but I'm tempted to say what Jesus said, so what? Even the heathens do that, okay? You know, to be a Christian, it's not just to care about me, myself, and I. It's to invest your life in other people. That's what our calling is to do. And, and what is your legacy going to be? Yeah, imagine if you were running a slideshow of your life through your mind. Uh, what people would have been influenced by, by you. And, and what I say at your funeral is secondary to what your friends are going to say about you in private, okay? Those are the people who really knew you, okay? And, and you and I, when we pass away, realize that people are going to think about us for a couple of days, a few days, and then, you know, we're going to get back on with our lives. Occasionally, you'll come to mind, and you know, we move on. It's always so moving when I'll run into somebody who, who will share about a loved one and, and tears will form in their eyes. And I'll, I'll say, oh, when did they pass away? And it was years ago. And I'm so moved that somebody years ago can still make you cry. That's such a beautiful legacy. And the truth of the matter is you're going to leave a legacy, good or bad. Some people will think, there's no legacy that I can leave. I'm a quiet, unassuming person. I, I, I'm a mom. Well, hold on a minute. <laughs> Moms 
are the ones who shape the personality and path of all of our children. Probably the most powerful legacy is, is motherhood. And there's my conversation at the funeral, there's your friend's conversation after the funeral, but there's another conversation that matters most, and that's the God conversation, where all the days of your life are written in his book. And what's amazing about people long dead in history is they're usually remembered for one thing. They did something significant enough for us to, to remember. Uh, recently, we had an, a very important person in our community pass away, the gentleman who started Give Kids the World. And, and what you might not know is he was a Nazi concentration camp survivor. And when he got out of that horrible situation, he came to America, and rather than saying, oh, <clears throat> I can't believe that my life has, has gone this way, he took all that pain and evil and turned it into an opportunity for, for terminally ill kids to have one last positive experience on earth before they, they went to heaven. Now friends, that's a legacy. And, and your legacy, it, it, you, it's either gonna perish here with the planet or it's gonna live on eternally because you impacted this, this life with, with the touch of God. Imagine if the Lord was to write one more book of the Bible titled, Things Christians Are Remembered For, and they came to your name. What would your statement or brief paragraph say? Actually, when you read through the Bible, there's a number of people who have a quick bio. Paul will mention folks who helped him along the way, some who heard him as well. And it's interesting that 2,000 years ago, none of these people would have ever thought possible that their lives would be pondered. Like Tychius, our beloved brother and faithful servant in the Lord. He will bring you information, for I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts. But how important it is to have somebody bring an accurate information about Christianity, from the right heart, I might add. You know, people today, they think, oh, I need to know something, I'll, I'll ask Siri. Remember a couple of months ago when, you know, they asked Siri who Jesus was, and no answer? Okay. Was it because they couldn't answer it or they wouldn't answer it? Probably atheists putting this together, and the last thing that they want to do is share anything about Jesus Christ. And friends, right now there are so many inadequate and incomplete understandings about who Jesus is. Even for preachers, you know, some, someone will say, hey, preach, pastor, I'm, I'm bringing a friend to church this week. Don't talk about sin, okay? Be surprised how many times I have this conversation. Okay? It's taboo. People don't want to hear about sin, and, and we'll, without understanding sin, then you're not going to understand the Savior and all the destruction that He saved you from and protects you from because of sin. You know, the message of salvation is best received from somebody that you know cares about you. You know, I have a friend who he likes to see his spiritual gift as being the, <clears throat> the hammer. That's my spiritual gift. I'm a spiritual hammer. I'm going to tell you the truth, especially if it hurts. So anytime I get buzzed from the office, hi, the hammer's coming up to see you. <laughs> oh, okay. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an account of the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. You know how amazing it is when somebody speaks to you with grace and tenderness, whether it's about important things like the faith or situations that might be going on in your life, you know. The smackdown never works, especially when we're talking about Jesus. Besides, the whole message of Christianity is not a smackdown, it's an invitation up. So I, I don't know how that got into our, our, our repertoire. And, and the ability to accurately articulate the message of God's love, it, it, we need to effectively do this. You know, I was at an event this Friday night, and I ran into a Christian from another church, and I asked about their spiritual journey, and they said, well, it's two kinds of Christians. There's the effective kind and the ineffective kind. And I got to be honest, I never thought about it that way, but 
Well, I guess it makes sense. You're an effective Christian. You're living your faith. You're sharing the gospel message. You're leaving a spiritual legacy, or you're an ineffective one, not doing any of that. Uh, Tychus, let's convey to anybody listening the encouraging news that Jesus has won the victory over sin, that that force that can devastate your marriage and mess up your career and destroy your inner self. Yeah, Jesus has come to heal all of that. Death, we're all afraid of dying until you get to know Jesus, then it actually is better on the other side. And separation from God has been removed. You don't have to live apart from him. You can have a bad day, week, season, and it doesn't matter. Jesus is glued to you because he loves you. Not to mention the positive, significant changes that, that are available to you right now because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Well, let's move on to another person's bio, Epaphras. He was a teacher at the Colossian church. He's the one who bought, brought Paul the bad news that heresies were arising within the church. And when Paul writes to the church, he mentions their pastor, Epaphras, who's laboring earnestly in prayer for them. And when you look this up in the Greek, it's agonizing intercessory prayer for the church. You know, this morning I was reflecting on the past week and I wrote down on my bulletin, a prayer life or you're going to wither on the vine. How many of you had a prayer life this week? I don't want to see your hands. I just want you to think about this. I don't want you showing off while the rest of us can't raise our hands, all right? I mean, a prayer life is where we connect with God and the Spirit fills us and we we're able to lay our agenda before Him and, and have God help us prioritize and get healed and see the opportunities before us. That's what happens when you and I start to pray. And by the way, when you start praying for other people, the Bible promises spiritual power is going to be released. You and I have authority from Jesus to move mountains whether it's moving mountains of pain or doubt or struggle, whatever it might be in people's lives. When we pray, God takes notice. It's been said that when we get to heaven, the one thing we're going to regret the most is all the prayers we never offered because of what God would have done, could have done, if only we would have prayed. You know, a prayer that's going to get heaven's attention is when we pray for the church. I hope you pray for your church every day. You pray for your spouse and your children and all the, put your church and pastor on the list. Might want to put the whole, both of us pastors on the list, okay? I mean, he doesn't need it as much as I do, so. <laughs> pray for us, okay? We, we, we need the prayer support. You know, Charles Spurgeon was the preacher in the 1800s. He spoke to 10,000 people every Sunday, and somebody said, what's, what's, the reason for your success. And so we brought them down under the cathedral to the boiler room. And they went to the boiler room and opened the door. And there wasn't a boiler in the boiler room. There was 400 chairs set up for people who would sit in this room and pray while the services were going on upstairs for everybody to re be receptive to the Word of God. That's what happens when we pray. That's why Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us, that God will open a door for the word so we can speak forth the mystery of Jesus, that I may be clear in the way I ought to speak. Sometimes we're in complicated situations, and it's good to pause and say, Lord, how do I handle this situation? It's amazing when you stop and pray that way, how all of a sudden... You get guided. Well, Paul mentions Luke, the beloved physician. And I want you to think about this with me. Everywhere the missionary Paul goes, what happens? He gets beaten and whipped and imprisoned. And he has a traveling physician with him to take care of him all the time. What an amazing gift God gave to Paul. And God gave to us two of the Bible books, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, come from this physician. Sadly, we have Demas, who, in love with this present world, has deserted me. You know, what a legacy. You get one chance to get yourself recorded in the book of life, and what does it say about you? Desertion. 
You know, Mark also deserted Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. But his story ends differently because he stayed connected to the, to the church. He stayed in fellowship with the, 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 the family of God. And what happened to him? Well, he ended up writing the Gospel of Mark as well as some of the epistles for Paul. And I take great joy in knowing that any of us who have bad moments, grace is available for us, extended to us, and we're redefined by God's love, not by our, our worst moments. And the truth of the matter is people don't end well. You know, I participated in a pastor's conference this, this week. A bunch of pastors from all over the nation got together, and they met here in celebration. Our church hosted the president of Princeton Seminary on Monday night. He preached a sermon here. It was an amazing experience. But, but in the pastor's conference, I, I was stunned at how many pastors have been hurt badly in the ministry. Uh, they're ready to quit in fact, there was a couple of people that I really poured into to help reframe their situation and, and bring hope so that they wouldn't throw in the towel. And, and the fact of the matter is when you read through the Bible, many people didn't end well. King Uzziah was one of the great kings of Israel, but one day he, he kind of overstepped his bounds, and, he, and maybe in a self-aggrandizing moment he decided he'd step in and be the priest as well as the king. And they said, no, no, you, you, you can't do that. That's against the rules of the temple. And he pushed him aside, and God struck him with leprosy. Had to spend the rest of his career locked up in private isolation. Can you imagine the conversation? Hey, uh, remember King Uzziah? Yeah, yeah, isn't he the one that got smitten by leprosy? They won't remember all the good things. And I wonder what one-liner will be on your tombstone describing your life. This one in a gravestone in Scotland. Beneath this gravestone lies stingy Jimmy Watt. He died one morning at 10 and saved the dinner by it. Okay. Apparently everybody knew Jimmy Watt was a tightwad. Put it on his gravestone. It would be a horrible way to be remembered. There's another gravestone in Tombstone, Arizona. Here lies Lester Moore. Four slugs from a 44. No less, no more. <laughs> what does that even mean? Okay. What an empty, pointless life we're seduced into living if Jesus doesn't dwell within us. I came across the story of Nicholas Witten. He saved 669 children from, from the Nazis. Uh, the parents were being thrown into concentration camps, and he figured out what was going on, and so he rescued 669 children from death. He didn't tell anybody about this. He m went back to England, carried on his life, and in 1988, his wife was cleaning up in the attic, and she finds this box and opens it up and realizes that her husband did something amazing, like save 669 children's lives. Caused me to wonder what would happen if somebody stumbled across your hidden box. Would they find your prayer list and your benevolence to other people, or would they find your secrets? That's why you have them up in the attic. What is it about you that's going to be remembered? You know, there was another Christian mentioned, Aristocarchus. He was at Paul's side when, when they got dragged out of the stadium because of the riot in Ephesus and imprisoned and beaten. He was at Paul's side when they got shipwrecked out into the sea. They, they, they swam for their lives for a day and a half drifting in the, the Mediterranean. You know, he was at Paul's side through all those, these struggles. Uh, Shakespeare wrote, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. And I like this because this is the kind of camaraderie that, that we enjoy. We don't squabble and fight, and there isn't lots of division here because our congregation is focused on Jesus and, and bringing his ministry about. 
You know, in the military, when combat is underway, everybody watches out for each other. But when there's no activity taking place, that's when the petty issues come up and the officers start to say, hey, your shoes aren't shined and you need to get a haircut. I wonder if it's the lack of spiritual engagement in the battle for the kingdom is, is when Christians get petty and we start to, to rip into each other. We prefer our comfort. Uh, we don't want trouble. Uh, Aristotle was right. Criticism is something we can easily avoid by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. And the question is not whether you will be criticized, but for what will you be criticized? You know, church people, we, we write others off real quickly. You know, they failed, oh, they're a loser. But God doesn't see that failure as a loser. No, he would prefer that his people would be more supportive and forgiving for those who got overwhelmed in life and lost their way and failed. By the way, we're fighting against a spiritual foe not to be minimized. Satan and his team. And it's a sadness that too often our theology is razor sharp in theological debates. You know, we argue about what it means to be a Christian and what is off limits and how you can lose your salvation and how it can all go wrong. And I just want to say, I call into heavy suspicion any doctrine that would render God impotent to reclaim, restore, and reinstate anybody who's fallen. There are any implication that God is less than absolutely willing and, and desirous of restoring the repentance center unconditionally because that person is to be reinstated to service, reinstated into the family. You know, in the Bible it says the call of God is irrevocable and all of you have been called and guess what? You don't get fired and you don't get to retire. You get to be restored, but guess what? The hand of God is never going to leave you. To see, the fact is all of us have been given talents by God. You know, some have more, some have less, but everybody has something from God. And here's the thing about God's talents. He supplies us with both the talent and the strength to manage it. He gives us a calling, and he gives us the ability and capability to leave a legacy of his touch on this earth. It's never really about us, it's about him. And when we wonder, how is your legacy going to stand? Let's say you got called to heaven tomorrow. What's the one thing that we'd say about you? Will anybody else be in heaven because of your faith, because of your prayers, because of your giving, because of your commitments, because of your conversations? And when they remember you, what we really want them to remember is Jesus in you. In 1 Samuel, it says, God honors those who honor him. He, he doesn't forget his own. And no life spent on him is going to end with anything less than his purposes and power being accomplished. It's amazing. People get martyred, and you go, oh, what a waste. But every time people get martyred, the church all of a sudden starts to grow. I think it's because these Christians get to the other side and all that prayer energy gets re-released into the world. God takes those promises, those sacrifices, and turns them into fruit. And whether it's being martyred or you and I making sacrifices right now, they turn into spiritual fruit. I think what's the most amazing about the Church of Jesus is all of us unapplauded people. Well, we're not going to be remembered for much. In fact, probably not going to be remembered that much at all, except for the fact that we allowed Jesus to move to us and through us. We invited and allowed Jesus to have his way and accomplish his will in our lives. We said, Lord, have thine own way, and guess what? Suddenly, eternal destinies get changed, and, and heavenly promises are, are, are answered. Because we stepped in and said, God, here am I, send me. And I want to tell you what's fun about this church. You know, we, we're people who dream big. We saw poverty on 192 when we, we, we initiated the Community Hope Center. But we realized that this society is going atheist, and so we're building a, a building for the next generation. Because anybody in our sphere of influence, we're going to make sure they hear about and, and experience the love of Jesus Christ. In fact, we have more plans. You know, at Easter, we had 2,500 people, okay? 
We had 1,900 more follow us online. Watch the Easter sermon online. That's a whole nother lot of people, yeah? In other words, we have available to us a social media ministry to get the word out to more people than we ever thought possible. And, and that's what we're all about, new ways to see God honored and glorified and spread. Well, there's a cathedral in Barcelona, Spain. It's being built right now. They, they expect its completion to be 2026. Do you know when groundbreaking started? 1882. You thought our contractors were slow. Can you imagine taking 150 years to finish a project? Four generations of craftsmen have worked on this project. Sons picked up where their fathers left off. Grandsons began to lay stones where their grandfathers left off. Great-grandsons are laying stones today on the same project that, that their great-grandfathers started in 1882. Generations of stonemasons who began and worked on a project. They knew they'd never see this come to completion, but they were building it for people yet born because they were building it for Jesus Christ. And Moses, he knew this. You know, he led the people to the promised land. He wasn't going into the promised land. You know, he lived and died for the hope and future of others. And friends, that's the way you and I live. We live our lives in the present for the future faith that's going to follow us. When you read the Bible, it's always a succession plan. Abraham gets replaced with Isaac and Jacob. Moses passes the baton on to, to Joshua. Elijah gives it to Elisha, Jesus to the 12 disciples. Paul said to Timothy, the same truth I have entrusted to you, entrust to others who will be faithful. And do you realize you and I are in this line of succession? John 20. I praise you for those who believed through their word. That's us. You know, a study found that two out of every three teenagers emulate the people that they know best. 37% of teenagers emulate a relative in the extended family. Do you see the kind of influence you can have on your own family? Maybe it's time for us to be a little more intentional about our faith with the people around us. You know, you and I, we live with the knowledge that we're not going to live forever, and eventually we're going to hand it over. What are you going to hand over? This one pastor, he, he, he came up to one of the leaders in his church, and he said, he said, hey, I understand that you are going to give your inheritance to the, to the local bartenders. Well, the church leader was incensed. I can't believe you're saying that to me. I'm giving it to my sons. And he said, yeah, and they're going to give it to the local bartenders. And I know the Bible says, you know, leave an inheritance for your children. But one of the most powerful moments in my first church was when I realized that some guy that I never met, who died before I arrived, had funded our church so that we could keep going and we could expand the ministries and the ministry of Jesus Christ would continue to go forward, even though he wasn't going to be part of it. That's when I started to understand what a legacy was. You know, people say to me, you know, I don't want my funeral to be a sad occasion. I want it to be a celebration of my life. And, and friends, the only celebration of your life that's going to matter is when we can see what God did to you and through you. Let me give you a tip. Live your life so the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral, okay? <laughs> Let me close up. Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Grand Lotz, she shared an important lesson she learned from her father. Billy said, as I got older, secondary things like politics began to fall away, and the primary thing came to the fore. And for her daddy, Billy Graham, the primary thing is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And friends, the best way to love others is to introduce them to Jesus and change their eternal destiny. I'm going to invite you to stand right now. We're, we're going to sing our, our, our final chorus. And, and afterwards, we're, we're giving hard hat tours. Okay, I'd love to have you go through the building and pray over it, write something on the wall, uh, something spiritual. Okay? <laughs> and if you haven't had an opportunity to participate in building the kingdom of God here with us, 
I want to invite you. Let's leave a legacy. Amen? Amen. I've seen you move. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. Tour, have a God week.